So now, Lord, as we look to your word, we pray for your blessing upon it, which you give, because you want us to know more and more about you. So we openly invite your Holy Spirit to be our real teacher, our guide through this great section. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're going to be in the Gospel of John in chapter 3. So if you have a Bible, that's where you want to turn. If you don't have a Bible and you need one, we have loaners on the back table. So please feel free to raise your hand and we'll either bring one to you. Oh, there's a taker. Anybody else? We'll bring one to you or you can feel free to get up and get one yourselves. Okay, so John's Gospel, chapter 3, and then there are two other places I want you to turn, and they're listed at the top of the notes I put in your bulletin. One of them is Luke, chapter 16, so that's the Gospel that's right before John, is Luke. And then once you find that, mark it, and then also turn to the Old Testament book of Numbers, chapter 21, and we'll be turning to these sections as the sermon progresses, so... Luke chapter 16, and then Numbers chapter 21. It's the fourth book, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, okay, of the whole Bible. So during a British conference on comparative religions, experts from around the world debated what belief, if any, was unique to the Christian faith. And they began eliminating possibilities. Incarnation, while other religions had different versions of gods appearing in human form. Resurrection, again, other religions had accounts of people returning from death. And so the debate went on and on for some time until a certain man named C.S. Lewis wandered into the room. He says, what's all the ruckus about? And they replied that his colleagues were discussing Christianity's unique contribution among world religions. And Lewis responded right away, oh, that's easy. It's grace. After some discussion, they had to agree. The notion of God's love coming to us, free of charge, no strings attached, seemed to go against every instinct of humanity. The Buddhist Eightfold Path, the Hindu doctrine of karma, Jewish covenant, and Muslim code of law all offer ways to earn God's favor. But only Jesus Christ dares to make God's love unconditional. So this grace is part of what Jesus is revealing to Nicodemus. So I call this message, Grace Revealed. So starting in verse 9 of John's Gospel, chapter 3. Oh, by the way, Jesus has just told Nicodemus something shocking to him, that you have to be born again, and if you're not, you can't see the kingdom of God. So verse 4, Nicodemus says, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? He's thinking naturally, and obviously that can't work. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. Unless you're born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. You have to be born physically. That's just because you're here. And then you have to be born spiritually. Because he says in verse 6, that born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And then he repeats himself. Don't marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. And then he compares the Holy Spirit coming into people as the wind blowing. You don't, and no one's ever seen the wind. You've seen the effects of the wind, but never seen the wind. If you've ever been around a place after a major storm, you see the effects of the wind, but you never saw the actual wind, but you never see the Holy Spirit, but you can see his effect in people's lives. So then after all that, just a very quick rundown, Nicodemus says in nine, Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and you do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you of earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said, how can these things be? Well, Nicodemus is referring to being born again. See, poor old Nick, as I called him last time, he's not thinking spiritually. Nicodemus came by night, and he's still in the dark. (laughs) 
He couldn't understand the new birth even after Jesus had explained it to him. This teacher of the Jews knew that the, of the facts recorded in the Scriptures, but he could not understand the truths in the Scriptures. Proving another Scripture to be true, which is yet to be written, because it was written by Paul, who of course wasn't even saved yet. He's on the Sanhedrin. 1 Corinthians 2.14, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Now, we've got to give Nicodemus credit, because that verse was written after the Holy Spirit had come down to indwell man, after Jesus had ascended into heaven and said, sent the Holy Spirit. But Nicodemus was a very, as we like to say, learned man in Israel. He should have known what Jesus was talking about based on his knowledge of what, what we call the Old Testament, what they called the Scriptures. And by the way, I think it's interesting that these are the last recorded words of Nicodemus in Scripture. We don't hear from him again. But at least he asked the ultimate authority, right? And by the way, I'm just going to interject. How cool was it for Nicodemus to be able to get time with Jesus? Can you imagine that? I mean, some of the most precious verses in the Bible are right here in this chapter, and Nicodemus got to sit there and talk with him personally. I mean... There's a movie that I just recently watched, and most of it I thought was pretty good. It's called An Interview with God. I don't know if you've seen it. I'm not going to stand up here and recommend it because it's pretty hard for me to recommend movies. But the way God is portrayed is always fascinating to me when they put him in a movie because it's like most of the time they get it w not only wrong, but woo -woo, way out there. <laughs> but this is actually fairly good. I think it's pretty cool. But anyway... Nicodemus had the ultimate interview with God other than maybe Noah and Moses, really, if you think about it. But Jesus proves the point to Nicodemus about him not getting it. He says in verse 10, Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and you do not know these things? You see, Nicodemus, he wasn't just a Pharisee, which is quite an accomplishment in itself. He wasn't just a member of the Sanhedrin. No, Nicodemus was a teacher and the best teachers know their subject well. Now, I'm sure Nicodemus was a good teacher, but according to Jesus, his knowledge of God and the things of salvation were far too limited because the word, when he says, you do not know these things, in the Greek, the word is gnosko, which means it primarily expresses the knowledge obtained by proximity to the thing known. So you should know because you're close to the scriptures, Nicodemus. You're close by. You spend your life studying them. You should know. You teach them. You should know this. So he evidently didn't know as much as people thought. He didn't know as much as he thought. Have you ever had that happen to you? You think you know about something, and then someone shows you that you don't? And it's not in a know-it-all mean way. It's just pointing it out, and you're like, it's kind of a jaw-dropping moment. You're kind of like, <laughs> you got to reach up and push your chin up like, Wow. That amazes me. Okay, so verse 11, Jesus goes on. Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. Now, there's something, if you're reading this, kind of a casual read, you might miss, especially in translations that are not the King James Version or even the New King James Version that I teach out of. First of all, who are the we and the hour that Jesus is talking about? Hour, not time hour, but O-U-R, hour. Well, he certainly isn't including, including Nicodemus in this statement, is he? No, he's not. So I did some digging as far as translations, and the King James Version and the New King James Version are two of only three translations I found that capitalize some of the personal pronouns in this verse and that means they would be applied to God. Personal pronouns, he, we, I, she, things like that. The other translation I found is called the Aramaic Bible in plain English. I don't have a copy of that, but I found it on, as my friend used to say, the interweb. And all those translations, all the other ones, don't capitalize them. Um, oh, could you, excuse me. The King James, New King James, and this Aramaic don't just capitalize them in this verse. Anywhere God is referred to in a personal pronoun, of course, except at the beginning of a sentence because they should capitalize the first word of a sentence in English. Anyway, 
Personally, I like the capitalization of the personal pronouns of God because I think it shows God honor, and it makes it clearer as far as who is being talked about. Did you see the capital H in the middle of a sentence? Oh, that means God rather than um, not. could be somebody else. So here in verse 11, we have we three times capitalized, and our is also capitalized. And I believe these pronouns apply to what we call the Trinity, the triune nature of God. God manifested in three persons. One God, clearly the Bible teaches how many gods are there? Just one. Many things are called God. Even in the Bible, things are called God because that's from our point of view. But there's only one God. And then there's God the Father, God the Son. You can say it louder. He, he knows. And God the Holy Spirit. <laughs> okay. One God in three parts. Already, it's beyond my total comprehension. <laughs> I don't get that. Anybody else not completely, fully understand the Trinity, the triune nature of God? You can raise your hands because it's like, it's not afraid. Yeah, but we can accept it because it's written and it's clearly explained. So we can say, okay, God said so. I believe it. I'll just go on. I don't want a God that's so absolutely simple I can totally understand everything about him. You know, I don't understand everything about my dog. I don't understand everything about my wife. I don't understand everything about me, let alone God, okay? So for him to have attributes I don't totally get is fine. But anyway, Jesus is telling Nicodemus that what the Bible calls the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all three persons of the Trinity, they all agree about how mankind can be saved. That's what he's saying there. And they always have agreed in that because they know it and have seen it. Know it's the same word that was in verse 10 for no gnosko, primarily expresses the knowledge obtained by proximity to the thing known. Who is closer to the knowledge of the understanding of salvation than God himself? Nobody. So obviously he understands it. And then he have seen, those two words are um, a translation of the Greek word horeo, which is the things which he has seen, speaking of God, which he learned Jesus in his heavenly state with God before the incarnation. So before Jesus was sent, he already had seen the salvation because the Bible says Jesus has actually technically crucified from how long ago? Before the foundation of the world. So obviously he knows that. See how the Bible is kind of intertwined with itself? Anybody ever notice that? I'll let you think about that while I take a quick drink. Okay, so... He says, you do not receive our witness. Now, the you word there is plural. So that means Jesus was referring to not just Nicodemus, but all the Jewish leaders who rejected his teaching. Jesus said Nicodemus, the, the problem that Nicodemus had and that the Pharisees had was this. They didn't receive our witness, the witness from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Despite knowing the scriptures as they did, the Pharisees didn't receive what God was telling the people. I have another translation I want to read to you because it makes it pretty clear. This is from the contemporary English version, and in that, Jesus said, I tell you for certain, we know what we are talking about because we have seen it ourselves, but none of you will accept what we say. That's pretty clear. I tell you for certain, we know what we're talking about because we've seen it ourselves but none of you will accept what we say. The law, the prophets, all of them spoke of the coming Messiah. John the Baptist spoke clearly of the coming Messiah, but they didn't believe him. And then Jesus goes on, verse 12, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? This makes sense. Jesus has told Nicodemus about the basics of salvation here on earth. And Nick just doesn't get it. So Jesus wisely tells him he won't be able to understand heavenly things, at least not yet. But here's another cool thing to add to your cool things about Jesus list. He doesn't give up on Nick. I love that. He continues to teach the teacher of Israel, and it works. I firmly believe Nicodemus became a believer. We know this because he risked it all in helping Joseph of Arimathea bury Jesus, take him down from the cross, and help him bury him. He provided the burial spices, over 100 pounds. It's a lot of money. 
So he would risk his position in the Sanhedrin as a Pharisee, as a teacher, by helping this guy that they just killed because he was a man calling himself God, but he knows it's true. There's no, it's not a problem that he said he was God. So he's, I believe, he firmly believe he became a believer, so it worked. Now, verse 13, Jesus brings up an interesting point. He says, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man, who is in heaven. If you know your Bible, I put a few things in here. I said, wait a minute, didn't Enoch go to heaven? Didn't Elijah have a dramatic one-way flight with his flaming chariot and a whirlwind up into heaven? Didn't they go? Yes, they were taken, and even without dying, ascended there. But you know what? They didn't ascend into heaven. Not then. This is where we turn to Luke's Gospel, chapter 16. And we'll pick it up in verse 19. So Luke 16, verse 19. And what this is, some people call this a parable. I don't believe it's a parable. I think it's a true story that Jesus is telling. But the one thing you have to understand He's talking about a rich man, and he's talking about a man named Lazarus. I don't believe it's the same Lazarus that was the sister or the the brother of Martha, the one who died, and Jesus said, remember when he went to call him out of the grave? And he said, Lazarus, come forth. And you know why he said that, right? Because if he just said, come forth, they'd all come out. And they'd all be standing there, and they'd look, and he goes, no, just Lazarus. Oh, okay. And they (laughs) go back into the grave. Because he didn't want them, so he specifically said Lazarus, because does he have the power to raise them all? Yeah, he spoke the world into existence. I think he can bring a few dead people back. That's not hard. But anyway, so the rich man in this story would have been on the cover of their People magazine, right? He would have been famous. He would have been well-known. And Lazarus wouldn't have been known at all. But in this tale, the rich man isn't even named. So in God's economy, he sees things differently. So verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. How about that for a description of such a difference? I mean, Lazarus, Paul Lazarus, he wanted the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. He longed for just that, which, of course, sounds like what dogs do, right? Our dogs, man, they sit right by the edge of the table and look at us, look like they haven't eaten in a year, you know? It's like, guys, five minutes ago you ate. No, I didn't, you know? So Lazarus is so poor, and he's got sores, dogs are licking him, and yet the rich guy, every care is taken care of. So verse 22, so it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Carried by the angels to where? To heaven directly? No, to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. Verse 23, and being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. This is also fascinating because does this kind of sound like there's no such thing as permanent annihilation when you die? That if you die, you're just wiped out, just (laughs) consumed by flames, gone, never to exist again? Or does it sound like, not that I'm rooting for people to be tormented eternally. I don't want anyone to do that. Jesus doesn't want anyone to do that. But there are people who will reject him who will be, and that's our message to them. It's a warning that this is their future without Jesus, okay? So he's in torments, and he lifts up his eyes, and he sees Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. The word Hades there is where they are, and it's the common receptacle of disembodied spirits. That's what Hades means. So it's fascinating. He says, then he cried, he, the rich man, Father Abraham. So he knows who he is, right? Isn't that interesting? I don't think he has a tag on, hello, my name is Abraham. (laughs) He's been taught what truth is. Have mercy on me 
and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. He says he just asks for a drop of water, and he can't do it. And he says, and besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from here, or excuse, from there, pass to us. So he just wants his tongue cooled off even. And Abraham says, there's a, there's a gulf, there's a, a cavern between the two of us. We can't go there. None of you can come here. The opportunity to decide which side of this gulf you were winding up on was when you were alive on earth. And you didn't take care of it, so this is where you're winding up. Then he, the rich man, said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify to them lest they also come to this place of torment. How about that? That's fascinating to me. He doesn't say, Abraham, go. He doesn't say, send Jesus. He says, send this Lazarus guy. Send him, the poor guy who laid by the gate with sores, wanting the crumbs. (laughs) Just send him. And Abraham says to him, because he's also concerned, so he knows about his family members, right? He says, please, don't warn them. Abraham says, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. So in other words, he says, hey, they have the Bible. They have the word of God. That's what saves them. That's what they need to hear. If they don't listen to them, they'll wind up like you. Verse 30 The rich man says, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Ah, there's the bottom line. He's recognizing what he needed to do. He needed to repent. He didn't. It's too late. But send him. Send him back from the dead. Then they'll repent. He knows what's right, but he didn't do it. How sad would that be to know what's right? And yet, not do it. And that's what the state of the rich man was. But Abraham has a great answer in 31. But he says to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though one rise from the dead. What did Jesus do? He rose from the dead. Is everybody persuaded as soon as he rose from the dead? Did everybody on the planet get saved and all of us are believers? No. So Abraham was so right. Even if someone, Lazarus, or maybe someone a little more important than Lazarus, Jesus, were to rise from the dead, people still won't believe. Now, in Romans 10, 17, it says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now until Jesus, so in other words, the important thing is, how do you get saved? You get saved through what the Bible says. If someone rises from the dead and they tell you about Jesus and then you get saved, it's only because that's what the Bible says. They're not going to bring a different message. But he says the word is sufficient, and that's what saves people. Now this statement, this story that Jesus is telling was the state of the abode of the dead before he died on the cross. There was the side of those who were awaiting salvation, kind of like a waiting room. And then there's the side of those who are not going to be saved because they set their, they determined their fate by rejecting God. And so that's where they wind up and they're waiting judgment. Now, when Jesus died on the cross, it says in, uh, Ephesians, that he descended into the lower parts of the earth. He descended in there and preached the gospel. In other words, to those who were hoping for the Messiah, 
They're waiting on the side in the bosom of Abraham. Jesus shows up after his crucifixion and kind of goes, you know that Messiah you're waiting for? What do you think? (laughs) Here I am. I did it. And then when it says he led captivity captive, he led those who were in captivity in a way, awaiting to go to heaven. When he ascended, he took them with him. Captive just means this. He didn't lose any of them. He took them all. That bosom of Abraham is now emptied out. So Moses, or Elijah and Enoch eventually got to go to heaven when Jesus ascended and took them with him. I just love that. But the abode of the, the dead that are awaiting punishment is still there. They're still, and it's more and more people getting in there who reject Jesus. This is the state of, of it now. This side's been emptied out. This side is still awaiting judgment. Okay, now, back in John chapter 3, Jesus says in verse uh, 14, so that's why he says, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who's in heaven. At that time, no one had. They went to the bosom of Abraham, but now they have since Jesus died and rose from the dead. So there's like an update to that verse. Okay, you ever have your computer update on its own? That could be frustrating. This isn't. This is awesome. Okay, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, I think when Jesus makes an analogy, we need to check out what he's talking about. We need to see what does he mean by this. It's important to check it out ourselves. So this is where we'll turn all the way back to Numbers chapter 21. And the children of Israel, and most of the adults, as Steve Taylor said, are still wandering around in the wilderness. And we'll pick it up in verse 4. And it says, Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. I don't know if you know much about the children of Israel and their wanderings. They did that a lot. <laughs> they got bummed out a lot. And, you know, their clothes didn't wear out. Their feet didn't swell, which means they had good circulation. They had amazing things. They were fed manna every day, which I think is really cool. Do you know what manna means? What's this? <laughs> That's basically what it means. There are words like, what is that? But they collected it every day, one day's worth. And then on Friday, they collect two days' worth, so they didn't go out and work on the Sabbath day. And so some people tried to collect more than one day's worth during the week, and of course it grew worms and got moldy and was yucky and overnight. (laughs) Don't don't eat that. That's not good. Just disobedience to God. It's this really funny thing. I like to say that God has kind of an obedience trip. You know, all I ask you to do is what I say. It's not really that burdensome, is it? In fact, you'll find that if you don't do what I say, that's where the burdens come in. Okay? So just go along with, if, if you can allow me to say it this way, go along with the program, because his program is awesome. It's wonderful. It's great. It's perfect. It's blessed. Can I get even a little amen? amen? Wow, you guys are really with this. is knocked me over. Okay, so they're discouraged. So verse 5, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. A lot of times they just whine to Moses. Here they're doing both. They're just, let's go for it. Let's, if we're going to whine Let's really do it, okay? <laughs> they whined against God and spoke against is what the Bible says. But why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. Okay, they said there's no food, but there's food provided for them every day. But there's no food. How many times do we go to our pantry There's nothing to eat because there's so much food in there we can't see past it, (laughs) okay? We open the fridge. Ah, there's nothing to eat. Let's go out. You know, that's that's kind of how they were. They had food provided by God himself from heaven every day. And they're like, there's nothing to eat because I don't want to eat that manna again. Like Keith Green sang in his song, So You Want to Go Back to Egypt? Bamana bread. (laughs) Manna burgers and Greg Laurie's favorite manna cotty. You know, they had all these different things available, different recipes, 101 ways to cook manna. So what, how does God respond to this? Verse 6, so the Lord sent fiery serpents, and I don't think they were on, on fire, I think it was fire in their bite, 
but sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. <laughs> Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We've sinned. It's like, oh, really? <laughs> For we have spoken against the Lord, and against you too, I guess. Pray to the Lord that he will take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Now, what was their concern? What did they say? Pray that God will take away these serpents. You ever prayed? People tell you, pray specifically. And I don't necessarily disagree, but I think you need to add the caveat at the end of your prayer that Jesus prayed. He prayed very specifically in the Garden of Gethsemane. Three times he prayed, let this cup pass from me. I don't want to have to go through this. Please, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. I think you can ask for anything in prayer. As long as you put that at the end and genuinely mean it, you're good. But they just came to Moses and said, hey, pray that God will take these away. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said this to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it shall live. What a strange thing to do. <laughs> Instead of just, since he sent the snakes, can't he unsend them? You know, it's like, well, sorry, once I, you know, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like the Wizard of Oz at the end, near the end, when he floats away in the balloon. It's kind of like a ride. I, I, I'm st I can't stop it. So he just floats away in the balloon, and Dorothy's like, hmm. Guess I don't get to go, right? It's kind of like it's like people think the snake. God's saying, "Well, the snakes are there, so I'm stuck with them now." He could have easily evaporated them, sent them away, have them die. Then they could eat the snakes. I mean, you know, whatever, any number of things. But he says, "Put a snake on a pole, and when someone's bitten, when they look at it, they shall live." So verse nine. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. It just seems like such a strange way to take care of the problem, doesn't it? Like, why in the... How, God, do you sit around and think of weird ways to answer people's prayers? <laughs> Where do they pray that? Get ready! He's nudging the angels. Watch this. Make a serpent, put it on a pole, stand it up. All you got to do is look at it and you'll be healed. Send the snakes away, God. Why do we have to go through being bitten? Oh, because you complained against God and Moses. You know, other than that, no problem. The biting's still going to come, but you won't die. Just look at it. All you got to do is look at it, but it sounds so lame. What a stupid thing. I'm not going to look at that thing. There were people that didn't look, and they died. How about that? Isn't it? Why did he have Moses put a snake on the pole and stand it up? because it's a foreshadowing of Jesus. That's why he told him to do that. It's not stupid. It's not lame. It's perfect, because God doesn't do stupid or lame stuff. Chuck Missler, if you've ever heard of this man, he's in heaven with the Lord now. But when he was here, amazing teacher, he says, this emblem, a brass serpent raised on a pole, is distinctive in that the Lord Jesus Christ personally applied it to himself. The more you examine it, the stranger it appears. Brass was the Levitical symbol of judgment. Brass was the metal that was associated with fire as a brazen altar, etc. The serpent was symbolic of sin introduced in the Garden of Eden. This is a strange emblem indeed for the Savior of mankind. But it's what God chose. Jesus used this reference to what Moses did to save the children of Israel from the serpent's bite as a perfect reference to when he would be lifted up on a cross outside of Jerusalem a few years after he made that statement to Nicodemus. Now, when the Romans crucified their victims, it was saved for the worst type of criminals. And they were to be crucified where people could easily see them on a hill or along a road and when people saw him, their being on that cross was a deterrent to crime. What did he do? Oh, okay. And this is what happened? Okay, cross that off my list of my to-do list. I don't want to do that and end up like that. See, that's why the Romans did it. 
So they certainly don't want to end up like them, and neither do we. But you know, there is a far worse punishment for sin than crucifixion. And that's what the rich man experienced. It's called eternity in the lake of fire, what Jesus also describes as outer darkness, separated from God and separated from anyone else for eternity. But you have one thing, and that is this, the knowledge that the reason you're there is because of you and the decisions you made. I don't know if you're familiar with Michelangelo, and I don't mean one of the Ninja Turtles. (laughs) I mean the artist. (laughs) And he painted in that Sistine Chapel, and he painted the ceiling, and then they asked him to come back, and behind the altar he painted more figures. And there's one of the condemned sinner, and I just thought of this, otherwise I would have had a slide of the painting because it's so amazing. And he's got his hand over his face, and he's covering one eye, but the other eye is there, and it looks so hollow, so sad, so deeply sorrowful, because he realizes he's condemned, and it's his fault. God doesn't send anyone to hell. He doesn't want anyone to go to hell. Or really, outer darkness, a lake of fire. People send themselves by rejecting Jesus. That's what's so sad. So he realized that. And they're in a state of constant punishment. Now, the serpent in the Israeli camp was a fiery serpent. Sin is a fiery serpent of an enemy to us. God sent the serpent to bite the people as a judgment for their sin. God sent Jesus to the cross to bear that judgment in our place. The serpent represented the sin of the people. Jesus became sin for us. Brass is a type of judgment, and Jesus was judged for what we did wrong. The serpent was lifted up on a pole for all to see, Jesus was lifted up on a cross for all to see. If people were bitten by a fiery serpent, they only had to look at the brass serpent and they would live. We've all been bitten by the serpent of sin. If we simply look to the cross and trust Jesus for our salvation, then we receive eternal life. The parallel is absolutely incredible. So this thing that I introduced, and I I set you up, hope you don't mind, But thinking, what a stupid thing to do. (laughs) Who cares? Why do we have to look at that? And it's such a beautiful picture of what Jesus did for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul wrote, For he made him, God the Father made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. good stuff, guys. (laughs) It's amazing. So looking at the brass serpent that Moses lifted up to save people, we can see why Jesus used it as a metaphor for his own death and why if people would only look to Jesus on the cross, they'd be saved. That's why people are funny. They They don't understand our fixation on the cross. It's like, To them, some people say that it's like wearing, in our society, wearing a little electric chair around our necks or a a gallows or a firing squad guy with a rifle. Why would we do that? But it's what provided us with our salvation. It's a beautiful picture. Okay, so then he closes our section in verse 15, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This is back in John chapter 3. So the two sentences go together. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Here's the reason why. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now I looked up the word whoever, and the Greek word is pos. It's the same Greek word, and it's used 748 other places for a famous word in our church, all. I don't know if any of you, if all of you know it, but all means all. That's all all means. Whoever is also translated all 748 times. 170 times it's translated as all things. 41 times for all men. So you can see why Luke chose this word, why Jesus chose it. It literally means this. Individually, each, every, any, all, the whole, everyone, all things, everything. Whoever. Is there anybody in this room that is not included in whoever? No. 
You know that I like to do the hand sign for whatever, whatever. We can apply it to this, whoever. It's you guys, it's us, it's all of us. And then whoever does what? Believes. It, now, believes is more than just like thinking it's true or knowing it's true. It's a conviction. Here's the definition. Full of joyful trust. I love that. Joyful trust that Jesus is the Messiah, the divinely appointed author of eternal salvation in the kingdom of God, conjoined, there's something else we have to do on our end, with obedience to Christ. That, that includes repentance, which is a Christianese word for, biblical word for turning around. You were headed in one direction, and you realize Jesus is now your Savior, your Lord. You need to stop doing that. And you know what? It's not just stop doing bad, it's start doing good. (laughs) Because if you stop doing bad, you go back to bad if you don't start doing good, because you won't be busy. (laughs) Because idle hands are the devil's playground. I don't know if that's biblical, I don't think it is, but the reference works, right? If you're just sitting around all the time, not doing good, not doing anything, you'll probably get into trouble. You ever notice that if you have kids, when they're quiet, it's a fearful thing in the house. What are they getting into? What lipstick are they writing on the wall with? Where are the magic markers? Are they painting the cat? What? Well, no, they'd probably make noise. The cat would. But you know what I'm saying? There was a time one of our dogs wound up with one of those circles around his eyes, you know, with a marker because the kids were bored and they were quiet. So dangerous. And then what? Believes in him should not perish. Perish means to destroy, to incur the loss of true or eternal life to be delivered up to eternal misery. So it isn't just physical death, it's the spiritual death. You see, if you're a Christian, you're born twice and you only die once because you're born and then you're born again and then you physically die unless the rapture happens for us and then you're on through eternity. But if you're not a believer, you're born once and then you die physically and then you die the spiritual death the second time. So... You can either be born twice and die once or be born once and die twice. I picked two births and one death. I just, you know, it sounds, just even the statement sounds better. And then the clincher is eternal life. This is a life that's active and vigorous, devoted to God, blessed, the portion even in this world of those who put their trust in Christ but after the resurrection to be consummated by new things, among them a more perfect body, and to last forever, without end, never to cease, everlasting. Isn't that a long definition for just eternal life? (laughs) But if it's going to be eternal life, you might as well have a big definition because you'd be around for a while, right, with eternal life. I love the fact that the Bible says we'll be with Jesus in heaven forever, and ever. As I like to say, once forever runs out, we still have and ever to keep going. Because we use the term forever for ridiculous things. So you went to McDonald's for lunch, huh? Yeah, and it took forever. Man, I couldn't believe it. It happened to me the other day. I pulled up, you know, the one here in CUNA has the two lanes, and then they merge into one. I pulled into one. There was no one. There was one car up at the front. So I pulled up. Ding, ding. I imagine something happened. Let them know I'm there. Nothing's happening. Come on. I got this opportunity to take, get through there fast. So I look over, and a car pulls up to the other one. The window's down in my car, so I can hear them. I can hear through my window from over there their orders being taken, but they got there after I did. Don't they know who I am and that I'm? What's going on? I just wanted to bend my steering wheel. (laughs) Finally, I said, hello. That car drove away. Then they took my order. It took forever to get my order placed. So we use the word forever in such frivolous ways. The Bible wants you to really understand that eternal life really is forever. It goes on and on and on and on. And after on and on runs out, there's on. And there's more. As the infomercials say, eternal life is like this. But wait, there's more. (laughs) Okay? Jesus wants us to have life and to have it more abundantly. That's why Moses lifted up the serpent. So if you look to it, 
you have sa- you have salvation. So that you live. I call this message grace revealed. And with all this mention of sin, we can see we have a need, a great need for a redeemer. Jesus compared himself to that serpent that Moses lifted up. All we need is look. All we need to do is look to him because he is a great savior for that great need that we have. And that, to me, is grace revealed. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for Jesus and for sending him and for all that it entails. These amazing references explaining to us the place of the dead, explaining to us that those people that waited for you, that hoped for you, that love your coming, but you didn't come during their lifetime, that they are now with you, that those who reject you, sadly, are still in punishment and will be. And then eventually judged, as it says in the book of Revelation. But Lord, we don't want people to go there. We want heaven to be as full as possible. So I pray, Lord, you'd help us. You'd inspire us. You'd encourage us to share our faith. If we're worried about rejection, all the prophets were rejected. All the disciples were rejected. Paul the apostle was rejected. Jesus, you were rejected and murdered. They probably won't throw a parade for us. But if they believe in you, they will. They'll be so excited. And it's worth that risk. So thank you, Lord, for sending him. And the comparison to the serpent lifted up is perfect. So we love you. We pray, Lord, that you would protect us during this week until we get together again. In Jesus' name, amen.